See how I'm doing a little left turn like that? Sit. I set Max up to doing a sit stay. We were just hanging out here and uh, walking around and then I wanted to get him into training mode so I just stepped into him, did a full circle. At the end of that circle I had him sit. It's a great way to set them up to put them back into a, uh, put them back into training mode. Hey buddy, good. He's really funny when he's excited. He'll howl. Very often he'll howl a lot more than that. He might start here, but you know, there's so much going on. Saturday at, at Home Depot, and so there's people everywhere. So I want you to pan to your right slowly and show everything that's going on here all the way over to these people in line there. And then all the way back to me to show what Max is. And so Max knows I'm gonna be talking for a while, so he collapses into a down, which of course is not to be done. Okay. So see how he made a mistake. And I'm just gonna reset him, put him back into an SIT. Uh, SIT because uh, you never, when he makes a mistake, you never say the command twice. If he breaks out of a sit like he just did, I'm just gonna reset him and I'm gonna say no, which I should have said no. I think I said okay to get him to stand up, but in general, it's he breaks out of a, um, a, a position to sit stay or down stay and you say no and you reset him like, like I did, okay? So um, just practicing this down here while people, I'm just sit while people walk past. And that's your basic sit stay. He's doing so well. In a situation like this, Hey there, how you doing? I'm gonna give him a reward, because that was really tough. That was really difficult for him to do with those carts going past him, but he barely even looked at them, because when he's working like this, he's focused on the person with the leash. And in situations, nope, in situations that are good, difficult like this, you should get a reward for doing something exceptional. But in most situations, when it's just around the house or property, I don't give him treats for sit anymore because uh, you phase the food out for simple things, but always give him rewards when he does something exceptional, like a sit stay like this with a lot of uh, distractions around. When you're gonna release him, all you have to do is go back next to him with your right hand, pat his chest, and say, go. And then he's free. And I helped him a little bit here, like that when I said down, you saw I just eased him down a little bit, just put a little bit of pressure on the leash just to make sure that he really went there, here, because hand to your right, keep going all the way to show everybody, show everything, there you go. Good, now pan back to us. So that's the kind of stuff that's going on here. You know, there's been people walking past with planks on their shoulders and sticks and things like that, so. Good. Been tough for him to focus. Of course, we practiced here a lot, so it was really tough at first, and I would just shoot for a real short 20 second down stay and then be gone, but every day we just got him to focus and at a higher and higher level, and. And now he can really handle a lot of different uh, distractions and stay focused enough to stay in the down stay until he's released. And of course, I'm giving him rewards for, for this too. Because even just people walking past with carts and things like that could trigger any dog to pop up. Good, so he gets rewards for that. And we're really, I mean, this is great to be able to do and to be this calm, but we're really after the byproduct of being able to do this level of downstay is that when he's released on free time, he's calmer. You just see it throughout his day. He's calmer, he's, he's less reactive, less triggerable to do whatever he used to do around the house, be destructive or whatever the problems were. So when you're gonna release him, you just go back, stand next to him, pat your leg and say, okay, say sit. 
always release him out of a calm sit stay. So that's so out of a down, just say, don't sit, just say okay, and he's going to jump up and run around. Keep him on the clock so that you put him back into a sit, release him from this no, nope, this calm sit stay where he waits for you to actually pat his chest and say go, go, and then you'll see that over time. He's just going to get calmer and calmer. If you choose to take him out into situations like this um, and practice like this, you'll see he'll continue to get more and more focused and calmer and calmer. Um, but if you are going to do this kind of thing, take him to a really busy place like this, just start slow because really this is about you learning how to do what I'm doing. He obviously can do it, but he can't do it unless the person that's handling him does their part like I'm doing it. And that might take you and your family members a while to get to that point. So just start doing that. Uh, just all these moves, all these things around the house first, around the yard, on your street. Gradually work your way up to being in a really crazy place like this. Okay. Sit. Oh, he's very happy and excited. So we're going to have him sit, we're going to step over to the person that we are greeting, give him a treat, and Max needs to stay in a sit stay, come back next to him, we say, go say hi, hey. he goes and gets a treat, then you say, come, call him back to you, good, and the come command is just exactly the way you've seen it throughout the other clips, sit, see how to set him up in a sit stay, I'll just step into him and do that reset. It works really well. At the end of that circle, just have him sit and he'll, he'll go right there. So we also have a dog in the background just to show you that he's not worried about dogs at a, at a boundary like that. Go. Hi. You can pet him with your other hand. Come. Next time, pet him with your other hand, okay? Good. Sit. And it's just a, a great little exercise to do. You can do it just with your family members, people that come over to to uh, visit at your house. Make sure that he's really in a sit. He has this tendency to sort of stay in his haunches and not really be in a sit. So make sure that you reinforce a real sit with him. And uh, yeah, it's just a way to keep him calm. Go. If you ever had a problem, give him the treat and pet him. Pet him, pet him. There you go. Come. So you see how he can get excited, but you have your come command. Somebody tries to pet him or he, he really likes him, he really likes this person, and uh, he gets out of control, just sit. Just use your come command and call him away. So there's no corrections, there's no you know, jerking on the leash and restraining him or anything. You just use your come command, call him away from that distraction. Go, go say hi. hi. Treat and pet. That hand pets him. So let's do it one more time. So treat and pet. Okay. Okay. Sit. Last time. Go say hi. Treat and petting. Excellent. Good. Why would he ever have to jump? Come. If he's getting all the hand attention, he's getting the treats, he's getting petted. And then if he does jump, if you ever have a problem with him jumping, no, do that. Step away. Instead of correcting him and pushing him away and talking to him, it's just no and back away. When he stops jumping, he gets more hands and petting. So instead of correcting, which could cause him to get worse because he'd think you're playing and he's stronger than you are. Just show him that that behavior makes it all stop. And then this, staying on all fours, gets him everything he wants, the treats and the pets and everything, and you'll see that jumping fade away. Also, this is just another way to make him calmer throughout the day. Practice doing that greeting routine when somebody comes home from work or you have a visitor at your house and he'll practice calming himself down. We want to do the training in as many high excitement type of situations as possible because we add all those up and he um, he's learning how to control himself and be calmer and, and be more immune to stress and that in turn is going to help him with his overall anxiety issue as time goes on. We always have him sit and wait. We step through first, 
This is how we stop all the dragging, pulling of you through the doorways. He, he waits till you come back next to him. Okay, he walks through without pulling us. See how that works? We're gonna also come out as well. So I always close the door, or the door will be closed. You have him sit first, sit. Open the door, make sure he's still seated. Okay, I'm gonna let him be a little bit closer to the doorway. Sit, so you can see him, so he's not in the shadow. He sits and waits. This boundary training is really important. This is his front door, so he comes in and out of this door most of the time and to go on walks and things like that. He waits till, he, till you go back to get him. He never rushes through, he never chases after you, you never allow him to follow you because that would destroy everything. So he needs to only go through these boundaries with you. Okay, on a loose leash, not pulling. See, like that. And many dogs, as you can imagine, come here and they've just been dragging people around for years, and certainly through the doorways and gateways. So that's the first thing we start practicing is teaching them respect for the boundary. It's your boundary, not his. And all you have to do is do these moves. Just have him sit and wait. You might have to reset him a few times. If he pops up, let's say, let's say he popped up, you just say no, and you step into him. Gently but firmly put him back and do it again. You might have to do it three, four, or five times. Uh, but if you do my moves, probably only have to do it twice because he knows how to do this so well. But you will have what I have because you're doing the moves that I'm doing. So always make sure that you do this boundary training through front doors. You could walk around your house and just do it in different doorways all through your house. Do it at the back door, do it at the front door, do it at doors inside the house. And it really would help your overall control of Max in general because um, it's very dominant to make sure that he waits at boundaries for permission to come through next to you. Not You never call him out of a sit stay or allow him to chase after you because if I was doing that at a front door for example, he would just be really used to, if I'm out in the yard, chasing after me. So always teach him to wait until you come back to get him. And since that's the only way he ever goes out of these front doors, and hopefully at your house as well, he's way less likely if that front door is left open by accident by one of the kids uh, to just race out that door and you know get hit by a car or something. So that's what, another reason why we do this exercise all the time. So now we're gonna move to the, um, to the gate and the curb. Okay, I always have Max sit before I open the gate and the leash is loose so I'm not restraining him ever. You're never holding on to him because that's not training, that's forcing him to be there, right? So leash is always loose, he's waiting. See how I step out, he waits for me to come back and get him. Okay, I'm not sure that you can see me sit since he's mostly black so I'll have him sit one more time right here at the, the boundary, the doorway. He waits till I come back to get him. Okay, he goes through with me without pulling. As you can see, I'm gonna do a little left turn because I have to close this gate since I'm by myself. And then I am going to have him sit at this curb, so you should probably be over there. So we're gonna have him sit. And he's kind of a crotchety, crotchety old guy. I hear he's... 10 years old or so. So I don't do a lot, lot of sits throughout the day. What I do practice though is I practice longer stays. So we're not doing a thousand sits a day, but when we do have him sit, we practice a stay like this. And you can, if he's doing really well, give him a reward just like this. When you come back next to him, eye contact, good, straight down. When, he does, when he's doing really well, when he's really calm like this at a boundary, out on the street especially, because he didn't used to be calm here. Okay, and then he waits to be allowed to go across the street. I treat the, the, um, the street as um, the calm zone. So he's not pulling me across the street. He is waiting to get to the other side. I say sit, and on the other side, I'm gonna pat his chest and say, Make sure he waits. Go. And he's free on the other side. So you got the front door waiting. You got the front gate. If you have a front gate, you have the curb waiting. All these boundaries and then across the street in training mode and then on the other side of the street, it's go. That's what I've been doing here. If you don't cross the street, that's fine. Release him on the sidewalk. 
um, do a little sit stay after you came off your property or out your driveway, whatever. Um, have him sit, do that walk around sit stay at the sidewalk and then the walk starts. And it's a great way to have him uh, increasingly over time be calmer and calmer on your walks because he anticipates what happened yesterday and last week and last month and he always starts to walk calmly because of how you handle him coming out of the house and off your property. So he starts calming himself down sooner and sooner because he knows what's going to happen. And also it's a, just a great way to practice some of your training as well. And then you get to start the walk like this. He hasn't been out since yesterday. So he's just staying next to me. Not pulling, see how he went to the leash and of the leash, if he does go all the way to the end of the leash, all you have to do is kind of tap it like that. And he doesn't pull. And actually out here in public, I would wear that loop around your left hand like this. And he could either, you could either just tap him if he starts to pull or come. You can use a recall, call him back to you. Good, let's say that somebody pops out of a doorway or another dog comes around the corner or whatever might distract him. Just call him back to you, use your recall. And that's another reason why he's not pulling so much is because he's so used to being called back to me randomly every minute or two or three. And he loves to do all this training. You can tell uh, that he's very calm and feels very safe with me. And he just really you know, wants to come whenever he's called. And so he's not gonna pull me around like I'm irrelevant. He's, I, I could tell him to do something at any moment. And out here on the street, come. I'm using a reward. I'm going this way so you can see it. Good. So why wouldn't he want to come my way when I call him away from something or when he's starting to pull on the street? So just keep doing this. You see, he, he knows how to do it, but you have to, you have to follow these rules because if the human at the end of the leash isn't doing what I'm doing, he's not going to be like this. He's going to go back to doing whatever he used to do before with people, before he came here. So always make sure you follow all these little simple uh, rules about walking max. Okay, let's go. Sit. Whenever we do this mat exercise, we always walk Max up to the mat from wherever he was. We put the mat down already. We walk him up to it. We have him sit. He's going to be on our left. With your right hand, you're going to... This leash is always loose. You're not restraining him. With your, with your right hand, you can tap it though if he jumps a gun and he'll go back. But with your right hand, you just pat his chest and you say, go to your mat, walk him over like this and say down. There he goes. If you keep walking, he, the momentum of the walking, uh, he, he might travel off the mat. So maybe walk a little bit slower than I did, but you saw what happened. And then I tapped him, he stopped and he went down. So his feet are hanging off the mat a little bit. So you could just do this, kind of like touch the tops of his feet with your shoes and step into him. Very, it's a very dominant move where the dog has to back away from you. I'm above him as well as walking right into him and he backs up. Very dominant, very safe though. Like it's not threatening to him, but it's just, it's a signal. It's like you're actually talking to him and he's like, okay, I know what that means. I'm gonna back up. These kind of little dominant things like always turning left into him, body language stuff really helpful to do and it's the it's the safe way and uh, the right way to be dominant over the dog when you reward him make sure that you put it on the mat nope if he tries to take it off out of your hands or touch your hand you pull back and say no nope and if he gets up you step into him you say no and you do a little reset like that a circle gently but firmly put him back I already said D-O-W-N once. So if he makes a mistake and gets up before you release him, just say no, reset him, put him back. You saw what I did. I just eased him back down with my left foot on the leash. Now he's back where I want him to be. Try it again. Good. See how he waited? He kind of went forward and he pulled back and I left it there. He's just really, he's a very happy dog. He's really happy and he's very excitable. You'll see in certain places on this little video, he just starts howling. He does that when he's happy. It's funny, but you see, I ignore it. I make sure he stays in his sit stay or whatever he's doing and we ignore it and we just continue on with the training and he stops it. So I'm kind of swinging in like that. Good, put it on the mat. He 
withdraw, he takes it off the mat. That's the perfect way to do it. And notice I'm not going like this, because anything like that is going to trigger him to jump up and try to grab it. So when I move towards him, when he's in a down stay, it's always kind of swinging in from the front like this. Good. And saying good as he takes it. And once you've got that down where you can step out in front and he is re respectfully accepting the reward from you like that without grabbing it out of your hand or touching your hand, then you can start practicing a simple downstays where he just accepts you walking around both ways and then you're always coming back in front. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, you always come back and reward him in front the same way. Good. <clears throat> So he knows no matter what you do or what little thing you do to test his downstay, it always ends with you coming back and rewarding him the same way. There's a whole bunch of things you can do to, to test him, of course. I'm just going through the simple things. The other thing is to apply pressure on the leash. Nope, see how it popped up? You reset him. Put him back, all I said was no. Reset him, put him back, and we'll try it again. This time, he's like, oh, I, I'm not going to let you trick me this time. He stayed there. Good. He gets his reward. Every dog that ever comes here in the beginning, I'll apply a little pressure on the leash, he'll come towards me. Because that's what their owner does. They pull the dog to them. So, but when he's in a downstay, he only leaves that downstay one way and one way only. That's when you go back to him and release him in that very specific way. Anything else that happens, he stays there no matter what. That's what this is all about. So he's got to stay in the moment. He's got to focus. He's got to remember, nope, nope, I don't get up for any reason except for just the release, which is done in a very specific way. So now I drop the leash, and since I'm in a safe fenced yard, I can walk farther away. And I'm just going to do a few different things just to show you how far we've gotten here with him. Good. Uh, obviously, I can do a wider circle. I can walk faster. You know, you always want to, with these circles around him, you always want to go both ways from in front because if you only went on one side and never went on the other, you start making mistakes on the side that you never walked on. So always do it that way. So if you go around this way once, go around the other way once, always make sure it's even. And then if he doesn't get up, doesn't make a mistake, guess what? Another reward. Good. Now let's try something. Let's try to, to get him to make a mistake and I'll show you how to work through a problem. So I'm going to leave the yard and let's see if that will trigger him to get up. If you're ever going to practice something that you know is going to be difficult for him to handle or he's made mistakes uh, doing before, it's okay to remind him what you want him to keep doing. So before I leave, I'm going to say down. And already he pops up, so we might have some work to do here. So I'm going to say no. Put him back. And he's an older dog. He's, by all accounts, around 10 years old. So to train a 10-year-old dog with anxiety that's never really learned to stay before, that can be a challenging uh, project. But it's really done the same way as you do a, a two-year-old dog or a 10-month-old dog. No, so I should have said no and put him back. If I had to reset him 10 times, I'm going to reset him 10 times. Probably have to just do it more like three times or four times. But you can just keep resetting. And I'm going to say down. Go through this one's first gate. So this is a gate that he usually will either, um, you know, he's loose in this yard. He'll follow us there when we leave the yard or when we come in at that gate, he'll rush to us to say hi. So he just popped up automatically because that's what he always does. So you would have said no. We reset him and gently but firmly put him back. Let's try it again. Down. So that time, he did it. He stayed there. 
he gets a reward. Good. Let's see if I can go a little bit farther. You're already seeing how to reset him and then put him back, get a success. Nope. I'm talking a lot, which of course when I'm training him on a daily basis, I don't talk hardly at all. So it's extra hard for him to stay focused. Nope. Put him back. I think I'm just going to shoot for one more success with the first gate and then end on a success because if we throw too much at him, and this is something for you to know, if you try to do too much in the same session, you'll, you'll burn him out, you'll, he'll, he'll lose focus, and you always want to end on a high note, you always want to end on a success. So let's just try to end on a success. Down, one more time, nope. So with him, always end on a success. He can't handle that much in one, at one time. At least break it up into a few diff different uh, three-minute sessions in one day at least. If you're going to do this a lot. Down. He waits there. I go through the gate close it like that. It's also, a lot of it's the sound of this too that triggers them to lose their focus. But we, we got him to stay there again. I'm going to give him a double reward, two pieces. Good. Top it off with nice reward for staying there. And then whatever you're practicing with him that you find in your environment that he uh, is triggered to pop up, he can't handle it. You just fix it that way. Try to get two repetitions of a, of a success before you end that session. And then come back and the way that you release him is he waits for you to come back next to him. You pat your leg and say, okay. You walk him off the mat, you have him say sit. And then with your right hand, pat his chest and say, go, let him be free. Always pick up this mat. Because all the dogs want to run back and hang out on it. It's not a doggy bed. Whether you get a training mat from us or you use a bath mat, which is fine, it's only for this one thing. So as soon as you start using it for this, it only goes down before you have him on a leash and you allow him on, just exactly like I just showed you, and you allow him off and then you put it away. Um, you don't leave it on the ground for him to hang out on or walk around on. Uh, this is a very exclusive place that you only put it down for the training and take it up right away. And his doggy bed is a free time place. Other things, you know, he can come and go as he pleases. You can let him have some water. So it's a lot more powerful um, when you use it exactly the way I'm showing you here. Only for this one thing. And it's a place where he stays calm, where he practices focus and calmness every day. And this is directly related to him over time having less anxiety in your household. So do it exactly like this. Practice like this every day. If you only have three minutes, just do it for three minutes, two minutes. But I've worked up to five minutes here. But it really helps uh, keep him calmer. And uh, now you have a video record of exactly how to do it every day. We're walking him up to the crate. We have him say, we say sit, we have him sit. And we open the door. And then I'm gonna show you how to possibly, if this happens at your house, you know, if you're having a problem with him going in, go, toss a treat in there. He'll follow it. Run all the way, silly. There you go. He's not used to going in the crate with the crate in the yard. The crate is in my house, obviously. He sleeps inside in the crate. So if that happens, if he starts putting on the brakes and won't go in the crate, that's all you do. Just for a while, just a piece of cheese or something. Toss it in there. He'll go in. He goes in. He turns around. He gets more. Let's see, here's a, here's a side view of what it looks like. But we always cover up the crate. And obviously, if it was a... Uh, regular plastic crate it would be sol a solid wall but I just wanted to show you we, we cover up the crate just to make it cozy he's in this crate because he I was told that he will destroy a plastic crate so actually I'll just let you see what we're doing he goes in there once he's in there you take off his equipment his prong collar his choke chain all this stuff is on him just to be able to walk him with ease out in public 
and you see in the other clips how we do it. Uh, usually we have a bunch of blankets in here. Today we just have a little one blanket, but I would make it cozier for him. He doesn't seem to have a problem with ripping up blankets, so it's okay. can put real cushy blankets in there so it's super comfortable. He cannot grab this because he'd have to turn his head sideways to grab this so he can't break his teeth. If he tries to pull on it or push, he can't. The door's the same way. This is the same bars. And uh, so he's gotten really used to being in this crate and doesn't have a problem with it. The, the uh, dimensions are a little bit larger than a German Shepherd crate, an extra large uh, plastic crate. So it's very roomy for him. And we just practice putting him in and out all day long, just like this. Take off his collars before we um, close the door. It's all about treats, going, getting treats in there, so he already perceives this as his favorite place in the world. Um, he gets his meals in there. We bring the bowl to him, open the door, give him the bowl, close the door. You're always controlling his access in and out. He gets a treat every time he goes in before you close the door. When we go to get him, it's the same thing, just only in reverse. Bones, chewies, all good things only in there. Don't waste, don't squander that power of the marrow bone or the bones out loose. You want him to think this is the coolest place ever because this is all, this is where he gets all his favorite things. So only bones and chewies in there so that you continue this winning streak that we've been on for a few months where he loves to be in there. He doesn't try to get out. Um, why wouldn't he love to be in there? He does sleep in there overnight, but throughout the day he's in and out constantly. So that you, when you do need to have him in there for three, four hours at a time during the day, just make sure that before you put him in, he's had a good time outside, long time, he's gone to the bathroom, put him back in there, and then as soon as you get back, get home, let him out. And overnight, he will, um, you know, he'll sleep overnight in the crate. That's what he's done every night here. When you're gonna take him out, you, this is what we do here, you don't have to. You can leave this on during the day for a couple hours, it's not gonna hurt him. Definitely always take this training collar off overnight for sure. But when you're gonna take him out, you just open the door. See how he's waiting for me? He gets a treat, he's waiting for his treat. See, the, the pattern is set. He loves, he loves this whole routine. He'll just wait for you to do my part, so just do what we do and you'll have the same thing happen for you at your house. Hook that up like that. See how he's waiting? Okay. Invite him out. Always close this door, because he's actually gonna wanna go in and out on his own, but you need to control his access in and out. The sitting and waiting, and the waiting in there, there's no sitting or there's no, no commands done in there, but he does wait until you allow him to come through the boundary, like I just showed you. All of that is just a, yet another way for him to, throughout the day, focus and think and wait for your permission to go through a boundary. Very important boundary, the boundary into his den. Dogs are naturally den animals, so this is his den. We've developed it that way with him. And every time he has to, to stop and think and wait to be allowed in and out of a boundary, doorways, curbs, crate, gateways, wherever you're doing it, he has to calm down. He has to, to think about what he's doing, focus. Every time he does that, he gets a little bit calmer. You do this stuff every day, and he starts getting calmer. Every week, every month, you see he's a little bit calmer. So make sure that you do all the moves, all the things that we're doing in our environment that's on this video. You just do it exactly the same way at your house. And if you forget, if you're having problems, re-watch this video because it's all here. You can see it clearly, you can hear me clearly, do it exactly the way we're doing it here, and you'll have a calm, happy max at your house.